Hi folks. Uh, so I've got another one of those, uh, one of these vintage uh, cast iron bodied uh, auxiliary deadbolts for you today. This is the Yale either 323 or 324. I can't really find any references uh, for this one, but it's an older one, uh, also out of uh, an old hospital, and I believe it uh, serves as an early form of uh, classroom function. I'll show you why in a second. Uh, the cylinder, again, is not anything super special. It's the one and one eighth inch, six pin commercial grade cylinder. Uh, really the only interesting thing about this is the keyway. Um, most of you probably don't see it very often because it's one of Yale's uh, commercial sectional families. Uh, I believe it's the GH keyway. The whole G series and really all of the uh, all of Yale's pretty much all of Yale's uh, lettered keyways are sectional for uh, large commercial master key systems. Um, yeah, so again, this is either a stainless steel or brushed chrome finish. There's a this one has seen a lot of wear from. You can see all the yellow discoloration. That stuff just does not come off. That's the uh, plating corroding a bit. But on the inside, uh, this c can be set up as a double cylinder deadbolt, but this actually has this uh, spring-loaded thumb turn adapter on it, uh, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, but to start off, as usual, let's try to pick this thing. I'm going to just... Prop it up for a second. Uh, this one, very simple. We're just going to rake it because uh, there is not anything terribly interesting going on here. Just very light tension, not blocking the camera with my hand. And go. Deadbolt extends. You can see this one is maybe just barely three quarters of an inch, probably not even that. Uh, so this would not be considered a very good uh, commercial grade deadbolt anymore. Um, yeah, by the way, when you are picking up deadbolts, uh, Anything less than three quarters, even residential grade, is no good. Uh, just if someone tries to sell you something with only a half inch throw, that's uh, that's crap. It's absolute junk. Do not uh, buy it. Do not use it. Uh, that will either bend or punch right through uh, your wooden door frame. So, now the interesting thing uh, about this and why I was saying it's classroom function is because while we have it uh, locked up here, I'm going to take a look at the thumb turn on the back. It's out of the way. And you can see that when it's extended, I'm able to turn the thumb piece to retract the bolt but I cannot extend the bolt. I can keep turning it to extend it, but it's not going to happen. And that's to prevent people from locking themselves in, but allowing people to uh, get out if they are locked in. So, <clears throat> let's uh, move along here. I'm going to start, as usual, by removing this trim plate as if this was mounted in a door. Uh, the cylinder and thumb turn would prevent you from just pulling the lock case out. So we have to remove those first. Pop that plate off. Again, a uh, steel plate with uh, some uh, 
uh, decorative or cosmetic uh, metallic plating on it. Uh, now you'll notice here we have these two screws. These are just uh, wood screws which would hold this into the door. Uh, these two large screws uh, at each end are uh, what holds this side plate onto the case. And then this small screw just above the deadbolt uh, is the set screw. And you'll notice that instead, unlike the Yale uh, Sergeant deadbolt that I showed you in the last video, uh, there's only one screw instead of one screw for the front, one screw for the back. And that is because this uses a yoke system, which has largely fallen out of use these days. And uh, you can see this metal bar right here is actually the side of the yoke. So now we are able to unscrew that cylinder. We can put it to the side. Uh, one note, you'll see a lot of locks these days, uh, particularly marks, use this tailpiece. This is Yale's obsolete tailpiece. They used it uh, for these old cast iron bodied locks, but the modern ones uh, actually use a sergeant style tail, uh, sergeant style vertical tailpiece. So I'll set that to the side, because really this is much more interesting than anything that is in that cylinder. Probably the only thing to note about the uh, cylinder is that uh, when you are repinning Yale locks, it is one of the few times where uh, even though Yale uses conical tipped pins, you should really try to use uh, Yale specific pins rather than generic universal conical pins. Uh, just because if you are using that classic Yale Para keyway or the E1R or the Yale 8, the, the standard Y1 keyway, um, the number three cut on those uh, puts the pin right at that curve, right at the extreme part of that curve in the top of the key, uh, which means that a standard uh, generic uh, conical tip pin will actually end up having the side of the pin rest on, uh, on the key. And uh, that can cause binding or failure to function when you try to turn the key uh, left instead of right. Uh, the Yale pins are still conical tipped, but they have a slight flat at the bottom, which makes them a little bit wider where they engage the key, and uh, that prevents that uh, little hitch from happening. So we've got the case screws out, and we can now just pop the cover plate straight off. Uh, there's nothing in the plate projecting into the uh, into the, on the face plate projecting into the side plate. Uh, only things to note here are this slot uh, for the yoke and this little hole right here which uh, serves to stabilize this post. Let's get the camera in here so we can see it a bit better. Uh, so first thing here is this yoke uh, this one's actually pretty sturdy, but a lot of uh, other versions of this uh, mechanism were very uh, fragile. And more importantly, if any part of this breaks, it's not a standard machine screw that you can just order a generic replacement for. You have to get this exact part, uh, which means either you end up carrying around uh, a dozen or so of these in your in your toolkit uh, to replace them with the exact uh, replacement part uh, instead of being able to carry just a handful of generic screws that are much cheaper and easier to find and that will fit a lot more things this one will pretty much only fit this series uh, Yale's other series would use a slightly different design and different manufacturer would use an entirely different uh, size and style. So we've got the yoke out of the way. Um, now 
we'll take a look at this thumb turn piece, which you can see is actually just a removable module that snaps in. And if we take that out, we can now see that this is actually threaded, uh, a threaded collar to accept a mortise cylinder. And the module itself just is held in by these two tabs here that go on the outside of the case and these three tabs here which go on the inside of the case into these three notches. Um, part of the reason why these fell out of favor uh, because it is a very clever design and um, in some ways it is a little bit better than uh, than the mortise cylinders, uh, mortise thumb turn cylinders, as uh, Jason Meeks from uh, SE Lock and Key in uh, Fondren uh, explained in one of his recent videos, uh, where he was talking about uh, a lorry deadbolt that had a, a failure. Um, if the cam breaks on one of those, you're kind of screwed because it can jam up the deadbolt mechanism and uh, and then you basically have to treat it pretty much the same way as a uh, damaged or inoperable uh, mortise cylinder that you can't pick and it's difficult and messy and can get expensive. Uh, but the reason why these specifically uh, became unpopular is really just this spring here because what would happen uh, sometimes with this sort of mechanism is that uh, if that spring broke or uh, like this one uh, if it got uh, corroded or gummy the tailpiece could stick at an angle like this and it would actually prevent the deadbolt from operating because that would project into uh, the path of the deadbolt and stick like that. And then you wouldn't be able to open or close the deadbolt. And that uh, creates a even more difficult to resolve lockout situation because then again, uh, with a mortise lock, there's no external screws uh, that you can access when the door is locked. You have to have the door unlocked in order to uh, activate that set screw and be able to take the cylinder out so you could then stick a tool in to uh, turn this out of the way and uh, remove the bolt. So uh, now we'll see that this has slightly more parts in it than the uh, sergeant deadbolt that we looked at in the last video. Uh, and we'll start by, you can see, just very simple again. Uh, this, dead, this lever is what deadlocks the bolt. You can see the tab on the lever. It gets pushed down and then the bolt is able to slide back and forth. And if we start to lift this out, there we go. You'll see that uh, pretty much the only other serviceable part uh, left in here is this flat, uh, flat wire spring. Just bows down in the middle very slightly. And what that interacts with is this post on the bottom of the bolt. Uh, and that just helps push the bolt the extra fraction of an inch into the fully engaged or disengaged uh, position. The lever itself, again, very simple, very sturdy. I think this is all, these are all brass parts, just with the, yeah, the magnet's not sticking to anything here. So this is all uh, brass, bronze, or copper parts from the looks of it. Uh, again, very simple flat leaf spring uh, that just fits into a slot in the lever. If we 
push that in. We're able to lift the lever out. Wow, that string is that spring is really strong. But there we go. So if this spring does break, it's a very it's a pretty simple uh, field repair to make. Uh, you just get a bit of flat wire of roughly the right uh, width and thickness, bend it around the right shape, and you can see uh, the the manufacturing techniques to use this are very simple. This uh, part is just rough cast uh, in brass and then uh, sawed and, and uh, ground down uh, on the areas that need a finer, smoother finish. Uh, similarly here, uh, this this one, uh, the casting is a bit less rough, but they have obviously spent a good bit of time uh, machining this. If I can get the light right, you can actually see there's this sort of curved striation uh, here, which shows you how they uh, polished this down and then they uh, plated it. Uh, one interesting thing about this here is you can see uh, stamped into the bolt RH which would indicate that this is a right-hand bolt. Uh, so if you wanted to change the handing of the lock, you'd have to replace this entire bolt module. Uh, the other thing is that you can see where a portion of the cast bolt was actually sawn away. And this is the side that faces where that thumb turn is. So you can see that uh, when the tailpiece of the thumb turn spins, uh, there's nothing here for it to push on, so it can't extend the bolt. Uh, I guess that's where the tailpiece of the mortise cylinder hits. Um, but it is able to strike this piece to withdraw the bolt. So, uh, reassembly. Just exactly the reverse of what we just did, and very simple. Get that back into line. Everything snaps back into place. Uh, you do want to make sure to uh, lubricate uh, this area of the case very well and the, uh, and the lever here because those are the moving parts that will get gummed up. Uh, we're going to just slide the front of the bolt in there. We're going to uh, push the lever down and angle it slightly so that, that post gets over the flat spring. Push that all back down. And that's done. Uh, drop the yoke back in. You can actually see how the yoke works here. There's the screw thread. And so as this turns, it's just uh, inserting and withdrawing this screw, but since the shaft of the screw is fixed into place by this collar, it causes the yoke to move in and out. So, drop that back in. Drop the thumb turn module back in. Actually, I think we have to do that before put the yoke back in because that tab has to get past it. Snap it back in, which takes a good amount of force. Get that all lined back up. Now we can drop the faceplate back on, put the screws in, mount that back up in the door. Uh, let's see, how are we doing on time? Just under 20 minutes. Uh, let's see if we can get this thing real quick. Just two small Phillips head screws. Uh, this, I will say that this uh, cylinder is a different vintage than the uh, lock body 
that we were looking at there. Um, this is a much more current uh, lock cylinder. So, get this guy. Yeah. So it works fine when it's mounted up. Not now. So probably. Yeah. And let's see. If the master key does it, we may have done something to one of the uh, master wafers. Yeah. With all of that raking. So let's get the follower out. Is all very low cuts on those keys, so so there you can see a very long. And get our tweezers. We're gonna have to be very careful here as we remove these pins because there are definitely going to be small master pins in a bunch of these chambers. So there we can see the Yale springs. These are older ones uh, that do not have the anti-tangle ends. And there we can see a small master pin and a much more normal size driver pin. Same spring, same deal here in chamber three. chamber four. Uh, now Yale has two different depth systems. One is uh, a 19 thousandths of an inch. Ooh, very small. Master wafer there. It's probably uh, a single step. Uh, which you're really not supposed to use anymore because of exactly the problem that we ran into. And oh, that guy out of there, and one spring left, and I'm not going to bother with that because they're all identical in here. So, all standard pins, lots of. Almost five out of the six chambers were mastered, and this guy right here was probably what was causing that jamming problem, uh, because that one, those guys, when they're that thin, are able to actually rotate in the chamber and uh, jam in place. So there, and there you can see a bit of scratching, probably from some picking attempts. But overall, that is what a lot of commercial locks are going to end up looking like, uh, just because there is a trade-off between convenience and security, and in the business world, a lot of times, uh, convenience wins. So, until next time, everyone, uh, have fun and happy picking.